And, um, of course, they give gifts to one another. They worship God. They celebrate uh, the Lord delivering them from the, uh, the Greeks and the empire, the Seleucid Empire. And, uh, of course, that is the whole background to the New Testament. If you understand what happened in Hanukkah, you understand how Jesus came and what the expectation was. So sometimes I think as Christians we overlook some of the history, some of the Old Testament uh, uh, I would say stories, some of the Old Testament uh, scriptures, and uh, we just kind of go, go right to the New Testament, and we go, how do we get here? How do we, oh, what's all this Roman background, and how did this happen? We've got to go back to the Old Testament. And so today, uh, for our Christmas message, I, I don't, uh, normally for me, I don't go into the story of Bethlehem or the star, things like that, unless it's appropriate to it, um, because many of us have heard it many, many times, and sometimes you know what happens, and this is no, no offense to anybody or no fault of nobody. We hear the story that we heard so many times, and guess what our mind does? Switch off. What time's the game? When's lunch? What am I getting for Christmas today? That's probably my kid. Uh, but in, in actuality, uh, the Bible tells us that not just about Christmas, but about the God who came down. And this is part of the story of Christmas. So this is Christmas is part of a bigger story but sometimes as Christians, we get stuck on Christmas and we go back, as, as, as Roy was talking about, we go back to normal life, right? Normal. And we don't, you know, we forget about the orphans. We forget about the uh, children. We forget about witnessing. We forget about sharing Christ with individuals, whether it's in TJ or down the street or next to your cubicle. We forget all that because we just think it's just Christmas. But Christmas is part of a larger story. And that is what we're going to do this uh, today. And then we're going to do next Sunday It'll be part three. Uh, part one was like sort of like a year ago. It was like two weeks ago. We had some wonderful speakers since then. We had uh, Brother John Holler. Uh, we had uh, uh, Mr. Eric Barger on Apologetics. We had Jacob, and now we're back to me. So sorry for the disappointment, but we're doing When God Comes Down, part two. We're going to talk about when God came down, because when we think of Christmas, it's a unique story completely for sure. But it's not the first time God came down. God has been dwelling with man for quite a long time, since the creation. The first part was in the garden and in the tent. The second part today is in the temple and in the flesh. Because if you could understand how God came down in the temple, again, Old Testament. So this is going to have to be an exercise on your mind. You have to exercise on your fingers. Maybe go to a book that you haven't read in a while, the Old Testament, and figure out how God came down and how that influenced many of the belief systems when Jesus came. So let's pray together, and let's get into our message today for Christmas when God comes down. Father, we know, Lord, in your scriptures, you've revealed it, that you have come down. You have come down not because, uh, Lord, you wanted to check out this place and see how wonderful it was. Lord, you came to save us. You came to save us from our sins. And, Lord, you've been dwelling with man since the creation. And in your pursuit, you have not given up. And Lord, the fact that we're here under this roof, um, Lord, shows that you have not given up on us. You persisted in bringing us to yourself, to be part of your family, to be your sons and daughters. Lord, I pray today that if uh, there's someone here who has not uh, embraced that calling in their lives to be the son and the daughter of our, of our great God, to be in God's family, to have the new birth, the birth of, that comes from heaven, that comes from Jesus. Lord, if, um, if they're running from that calling, Lord, I pray that they would um, surrender to your pursuit and may they be saved and forgiven of their sins. Thank you, Lord, for today. That, that's really why Christmas is celebrated, because you came to deliver us from our sins. As it says in the gospel, his name shall be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that that is the most magnificent thing we can think of. You incarnated in human form to forgive us and to die for our sins. We praise you, Lord, today. Show us, Lord, more about you, ourselves, our need for you. And, Lord, in, in, in today, if there's any barricades, Lord, of pride and arrogance in our hearts, uh, Lord, may they come tumbling down like the walls of Jericho, may they come tumbling down at your feet. We praise you, Lord, today. We worship you, Jesus, as God. In Jesus' name, amen. When God comes down, 
Many times we read the Bible and we figure all of our current situations and our difficulties and education and politics and geopolitics and all the stuff that's going on in the world. And we go, how do we read our Bible? Um, Is it just a story that many people read it that way? It's just a story to escape the world. We get, you know, happy for a few minutes and we go back to normal life and, and people get depressed. In fact, if you think about it, this is, uh, in many ways, this is one of the most depressing times for a lot of people. I mean, no, we're overjoyed and praise the Lord. We have family, my children, and um, sometimes I'm trying to get away <laughs> and just be in, in, in solitude sometimes. Uh, but in many cases, people today, people around the world today, go through the most depressing times. You think about it, it's the... Uh, the Tale of Two Cities. I remember that reading that book by Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. And it was the worst of times. People today may wake up today and go, this, you know, just get it over with. And a lot of times comes from uh, maybe loneliness, maybe isolation, maybe just the fact that they uh, have been rejected or turned away. And hopefully today, after this message, you will hear um, that there's one person really has never given up on humanity, individuals, and that's God. And you could see that God has come down to us in the flesh. And God has come down to us, and next week we'll talk about his spirit. And we'll talk about something that many, many few Christians have, um, have understanding of, is that's uh, in the New Jerusalem. Because God's not done with, uh, with us yet. I mean, it, it's, imagine Christmas, we isolated to December 25th, and we move on to our normal lives, right? Uh, everybody's in a great mood today and tomorrow and the next day. Um, I'm sure I'm going to be in a good mood tomorrow. I don't have to work, so praise the Lord for that. But the problem is it's going to come January 2nd or 3rd, and we're going to back to normal, and people are going to go back to their normal habits and uh, not being nice. And it, It's a normal pattern of society, right? Um, people give less. People are less charitable. And that's why I challenge our congregation about, the, the and, and Brother Roy said the same thing, it's don't be a Christian that's driven by calendar. It's so hard. In our society, we're driven by calendar. But Christians are not driven by calendars. This is no more special than it was last Sunday or will be next Sunday. Why? Because we're worshiping Jesus. Sure, the holiday season, it's beautiful. Sure, we have more gathering time and there's uh, obviously more food. And uh, I'll be able to tell by this, you know, how much any pants I can get in after the second. I'll be able to tell you how Christmas was this season. But nonetheless... We tend to go back to normal. We tend to go back to not really caring about a lot of things except our normal life, our normal mundane activity. And in that mundane is where God is. In that mundane is where God wants to meet us. In the mundane, we think, you know, the mundane is the normal activity, the you know, the non-holiday traditions. Sunday, May 2nd, or Sunday, May 17th. What's Sunday, May 17th? Nothing, just Sunday, just worshiping the Lord. And it should be as, as glorifying to the Lord as, as it is today. And we should be in active ministry, just as it is in May, as it is in December, as it is in September. Because we shouldn't be driven by calendars. We should be driven by the Lord, and we should be uh, motivated by His Spirit to do His work. And so the Bible, and we say, what's God's destiny for us. He has a destiny, and that's what we're going to talk about, God in the New Jerusalem next week. Because Christmas is just a part of the story. Don't make it the whole story. Go on, like the book of Hebrews says. Go on to maturity. Because you know what happened after Jesus came, died, resurrected, and ascended? Do you know what actually happened? God came down again. Did you know that? His spirit came down. And his spirit dwells in us and through us and empowers the church to do the work. So you could say Christmas was just a part of the story. God came down again. In the book of Acts, it says the spirit came down. And God's going to come down again. Did you know that? When Jesus cracks the sky and all the earth will see him, all peoples will see him, that he's the king of kings and lord of lords, it will be a frightening thing to the unbeliever. But it will be the glorious thing for the believer, right? But God will come down again. Just like in Christmas, right? Christmas, you can say Christmas will happen again. Jesus will be visiting the planet. And this time, he's not going anywhere, praise the Lord. He's not going back. He is going to come and rule and reign and fulfill the promises of God. 
By the way, this is all in the Old and New Testament. We have to read the Old Testament and the New Testament in stereo. I've said this before, but it's good to remember that. Many people today will tell us, don't read the Old Testament. It's, uh, it's too frightening for people. It's scary. You know, people don't want to hear about that. Um, well, have you read some of the New Testament? It's as equally and, and, and respectively as, as you want to call it frightening. It's challenging to see Jesus coming and judging the nations. That's not in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. The New Testament tells us that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God, knowing the goodness and the severity of God. Did you, did you ever read those verses? I'm sure that's not the, the devotional that you want to hear today. But it's to understand that in both Testaments, we see the full picture of God. If you just listen to the New Testament, you'll be like in mono, right? You just be, some things will you pick up, some things you'll know, some things you'll hear, but it won't be fully in stereo. You have to listen to both, each speaker, the Old and New Testament. But let's continue because Jesus, the Bible tells us that God was in the garden. And in the garden, God created man. And in the garden, God dwelled with man. And in the garden, man turned against God. We know the story. We, we studied it a few weeks ago. Uh, but God was in the pursuit of man because after man sinned, God had a plan of redemption. Even back then, the plan was to bring man to himself to be his friend. That's ultimately what you have to remember. God did not create you just because he wanted to create someone. He created you to be his friend. He created you to be part of his family. Do you know that's ultimately what God wants? For you to be part of his family, to be his friend, to walk with him. It's not just a calendar thing. It's a life thing. That's what God created you for. In fact, we could say he didn't create us just to go to heaven. Did you know that? Okay, I created you, you got saved, go to heaven now. He created you with the same plan, to have a relationship with him so he can use you to bring others to him, right? He can use you to bring others to him. That is part of the creation of God. Part of, his, part of our salvation is to know God that intimately. But the Bible tells us that God moved on. It's almost like if God changed addresses. He keeps changing addresses in each section of history. You have to know the Old Testament to do that. Because God went from the garden to the tent, the tent of meeting. What is the tent of meeting? If you remember, the Old Testament tells us that there was this uh, Mount Sinai. God drew Israel out of Egypt. God had made his relationship with Abraham, and he loved Abraham. And through Abraham, all the nations, all the Gentiles, you and I will be blessed through his family. God began to work in a family, just like your family, just like my family. God began to work through a family. And through this family, the Messiah would come. Jesus would come. But before that, they had to go through uh, difficult times. And they went through Egypt. And God brought them out of Egypt through Moses. And it was a very powerful thing. If you read the book of Exodus, all these miracles and signs and wonders, this amazing power of God delivered them through the blood of the Lamb and bringing them into the wilderness. In the wilderness, God showed them how to worship Him. Remember, God is a holy God. We're not free to approach him however way we want. It's not us who calls the shots. It's him who calls the shots. I know sometimes in our proverbial American society, we think we need to be in charge. And, you know, I'm a self-made man and we need to go through this. And I'm going to be in charge of. And when you become a Christian, you realize, um, boy, when I was in charge, I really made a mess of my life. I literally almost torpedoed it. It took God's redemptive power to, you know, bring me out of that drowning condition. I thought I was doing pretty good. I actually thought that I was a really good guy compared to other people. But the Bible never tells us to compare to other people. There will always be worse and there will always be better. The Bible tells us to compare to Jesus. And compared to Jesus, I was completely lost, completely blind, completely unable to fulfill anything that God had ever for me. And I continue in that path. I would have been destroyed forever. Now, God rescued me, and God put us in a path of relationship with him. Same thing with the Jews. They didn't know who this, I mean, they were barely getting to know God, how holy he is. And God had to teach them. So in Mount Sinai, he parked them there for one year. You read the Bible, one year next to Mount Sinai. And they were to get his word, through Moses, they got the commandments, which 
They weren't very good at keeping them, by the way. It took them less than a few hours. They were breaking them. As soon as Moses came down, gone. They were worshiping, idolatry, immorality. And Moses was so angry. <laughs> he broke the tablets. Right? God gave him the second tablets. But the inability to keep God's word, it's the same thing as us. It's the same thing as us. But so God parked himself in a tent and to, so you can know him. So the people lived in tents. Guess where God lived? In a tent. See how beautiful the Lord is? He, he, he always is with his people. If they lived in a, in a palm tree, God would have lived in a palm tree. If they would have lived in a, in a cave, God would have lived in a cave. Why? Because God's plan is to always be with his people. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. I want to show you something very, very quickly. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing book, by the way, the book of, um, um, the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Because when you read the Old Testament, you have to read the New Testament as well. You say, how does this relate? Hebrews 1, one of my favorite Christmas uh, verses. This is one of my favorite Christmas verses. And you can start today, giving it away to someone. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1. I'm pretty sure they'll be like, that's not a normal Christmas verse, is it? Where's Isaiah 9.6? Well, look at this one. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And in the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, he upholds all things by the word of his power when he had purified uh, when he made purifications for sins, so when he offered himself for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. There it is right there. The whole Christmas message in three verses. God spoke to people in the past through the prophets and many glimpses. You can translate that glimpses in different, different portions. It wasn't fully, just different ways, different hints throughout the Old Testament. But in the last days, he's spoken to us by Jesus the final revelation of what God ultimately wanted to, uh, for us to know. It's in Christ. So the fullness of the revelation of God comes to us in Jesus. Now it says that in the Old Testament that God dwelt in a tent because his people lived in a tent and they had to know him. And they had to know him in such a way that they were to come into the temple in a holy way. And they had priests that were able to lead the worship of God. And they could only come to that holy of holies, that, that, that special place inside the tent once a year. But we're told that the, that the tent of meeting was facing east. And uh, we know that in the, in the Garden of Eden, it was in the east of the garden where God told Adam and Eve that they couldn't come back into the garden anymore. They were banned from the garden after sin. After they sinned, they were banned. Read it, it's right there, it tells us, in the east. And yet the tent of meeting is facing the east, letting us know, as we talked about it last time, God's open again. Sin has to be dealt with. But through the sacrifice of animals and through the sacrifice of uh, uh, the different bulls and goats and uh, different lambs and different sacrifices, God could be approached again. And you say, well, why God would do that? I mean, that's, inc that's incredibly cruel. We don't know the depths of sin. That's one thing Christians and, and people in general um, don't know the depths of sin. Don't, don't know how incredibly uh, horrible it is. We wink at it, and we don't think nothing of it if we lie. We think nothing of it if we have a terrible attitude to our husband or our wives. We don't think, think, we think about it. Yeah, it's, just, it's just me. But the reality of sin is so grave that it takes the death of an innocent person in order for that sin to be covered. Did you know that? If you were in the Old Testament and you, if you were a child and you were disobedient to your parents, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Only in my house. We would have to bring a sacrifice in order for that sin to be atoned for. Uh, obviously, that would be dealt with. It was very harsh in the Old Testament how they dealt with uh, disobedience and rebellion. But that was because man needed to understand the gravity of sin. Now, we don't do that to this point today, but the sin is no less serious. We wink at it. We don't really think about it twice. 
But it's sin is very, very serious. So if we would look at sin in that capacity and go, oh, how sinful of me to do that, how grave of me to do that, um, you would understand why the Old Testament has these sacrifices, has these blood atonements. Why? Because God is trying to cover the sin of mankind. Now, the Bible tells us, oh, one thing, if you ever read Pilgrim's Progress, you ever, you ever read it? Who's read Pilgrim's Progress? Okay. Remember when um, Christian is going in, and he falls into the, the, the pool of the spawn, the, the, the swamp there? And then he's like, why? And he falls in there, and the, the other guy, uh, is it, what was it, flexible? Or the guy you can, I forgot his name. He's the one that keeps changing his mind. He leaves, and he goes back to the city of destruction. And Christian's like, okay, this guy left. But, and he talks to the guy who helps him out, and he's like, why doesn't the pool get covered up? Why is it still here? Are there warning signs so people don't fall in it? And then he's told that this is where all the sins of mankind, where they, they fall into, all the, the yucky stuff, the, the swamp. The, 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 I mean, if you, if you put it in your mind's eye, the idea of this swamp being full of yuck, garbage, junk, filth. And he's told that this is where all the sin of mankind, all the immorality, the, the bad attitudes, all of our sin, they fall into. And man is, is always falling into that sin. And um, he goes, all right, well, this is, this is bad. <laughs> but there was no, man will always going to have that capacity to sin. And you see how gross it is in the sight of God. I mean, you wouldn't drink from your toilet, would you? Uh, I mean, that, that's the capacity that we have to think about. That, and that is yet not as bad as sin is. Oh, pastor, you make me feel so bad. Uh, I said, because we don't really think like God. We think like the world. But when you become godly, right, when you think like, that's what godliness is, is to be filled with God, to think like God. When you think like God, then you begin to think, my sin is really serious. I need to walk very carefully how I live my life, how I approach others, how I mimic and, and imitate the life of Jesus. But the Bible says it's open. God can, you can come to God now. You're not banned like Adam and Eve were. You can come. And God welcomes you, and that was at the tent of meeting. But then God moved again, and this is where we start our study. He goes into this place after the wilderness. The Jews go into the land, and of course, they begin to live not in tents anymore. They begin to live in buildings. So where does God move to? He moves to this beautiful area, Jerusalem. I pray that I could go there next year. I pray that you can go with us as well. Uh, this beautiful area, Jerusalem, and he moves into a building of stone, and it's called the temple. In fact, we're told that this temple was magnificent. It was just incredible. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was, um, the architect was done by David, but it was built by Solomon, his son. And we see the story that God moves from garden to tent to the temple now. And these are what they call milestones, milestones in the Bible. By the way, uh, anybody know where the word milestone came from? Um, if, if you know, it came from the Romans. The Romans had these stones that they built, and where the, when the, the army would march in different parts of the world, they would set up these stones. And every stone, every, every uh, um, you say every mile, you would say, they would set up these stones as a reminder how far they were from Rome. Everything went back to Rome. So if they were, you know, 300 stones away, they were 300 miles away from Rome. And, that's, and they call it a milli, which we get our word mile, which we get our word milestone. It's these this, this reminders of where you are in respect to Rome. That was the Roman Empire. Now, the Bible has these incredible milestones in the scripture, too, to remind us where we are in history. And one of the ones is the temple, the temple. In fact, the temple is so key to understand God's plan of salvation that God gave the Jews two temples. They were both destroyed, but he gave them two. And every history of the Jews, every history of the Old Testament is marked by these milestones. When is the temple? Where was the temple? Was this the first temple or was that the second temple? By the way, Jesus lived under the temple. Did you know that? Which temple? The second temple, that's right. So even Jesus himself was under the temple. These are markings, these are milestones that we have to remember in the life of Jesus, in the life of the Bible, in the life of the history of, of the people in the Bible. But we see something interesting. Turn to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2, another Christmas verse. 
Because when you talk about the temple, the temple came with someone. It was like if God was, you know, if the tent of meeting in the wilderness had priest, the temple, which also had priests, but there was also someone near the temple that was brand new to the history of Israel. And they've never had one before until Saul came uh, because they wanted one so bad, uh, like the other nations, which was their mistake. They had, they had God, but they wanted someone else representing God. And of course, I'm talking about a king, a king. Israel wanted a king. God wanted to give them a king. Because when the temple came, there's two things that are important to remember. You have a temple and you have a king all the time. Temple and king. Keep those two things in mind. Whenever the temple was there, they had a king. David was anointed king. And the first, one of the first things he wanted to do was to build God a house. In fact, we're told in Samuel, God, I'm so grateful that you've done so much for me. But I live in a palace. And you live in a little tent over there in Shiloh. He said, that's not good. I want to build you a house. And he wants to build God a house. But God tells him, David, your heart's right. I know you want to do this for me, but your hands are full of blood. You're a warrior. Uh, you can't do this. Uh, your son will build it, Solomon, and therefore another king. And then Solomon had sons, and they had sons, and it became the line of David, the house of David. So David wanted to build God a house, but God says, David, your heart's in the right place, but you can't build it for me. But guess what? I'm going to build you a house. You ever see that Second Samuel chapter 7? I'm going to build you a house, uh, David. Of course, he wasn't talking about a physical structure. He was talking about the line, the family of David. So David wants to build God a house. God says, I'll do you better. I'll build you a house, a family. And in that family will be the king, the one that will never stop ruling and reigning from your family. He will be the king, and nobody's going to take his throne away. No matter who likes it, the UN, the US, Obama, whoever doesn't like it, God's going to set a king, and no one's going to take him away. That's what the Bible says. And that was the promise. Is in the New Testament? Yeah, but you know where it came from? In the Old Testament. So we have to, read, you know, to listen to the speakers again, old and new. But then we have one of those famous psalms about a king. Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a, va a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand against, and the rulers of, of this earth, they take counsel against, uh, they take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Now, this psalm was about a king. Now, whether it was David or not, we don't know. Maybe it was. But it says that God was going to build David a house, a family of kings. Ultimately, Jesus will be the king. But in Psalm 2, we're told this incredible story that people are not going to like that. They're not going to like that God has a king. And they're going to counsel together at the UN. And they're going to say, we don't like that God is holy and he's going to set up his kingdom. We like multiculturalism. We like people to have a say in everything. Right? We want people to take part in it. And the idea that God is so exclusive, that God is unique, that God is holy, and he has a king that's going to rule, forget it. We need to ban that idea. We can't have God saying those things. And so they're going to take counsel together, it says, against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, the anointed here was, of course, the king, David. Could have been David. Could have been maybe one of David's sons. But, of course... This verse is used in the Bible, the New Testament. Remember the speaker, Old New Testament? The New Testament says this is about Jesus. And that people in the New Testament were so against Jesus being the unique Son of God. In fact, this verse was used by the apostles. When the apostles saw that the people were against them for preaching the resurrection of Jesus, they began to persecute the apostles. And they will begin to persecute us and they'll begin to persecute believers, which they already have, by the way. On Wednesday, we'll talk about it. I'm not going to you know, let the cat out of the bag. But this year has been one of the most bloodiest, most persecuted uh, uh, years uh, for Christians in the entire history. I don't know if you knew. I know, I know we live in California. Weather's nice, and there's avocados and all these wonderful, beautiful things. I like them. 
And it could get us blinded to the reality of how Christians live. You are amazingly privileged. I mean, it's like you walk up to, we should walk up to each other and say, amazing. You're intact. Your family's intact. And you have a job. Oh, my. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Why? Because that is such an anomaly in the rest of the world for Christians to have what you have. And what makes us so privileged? None. Just the grace of God. That's it. Don't abuse it. Don't go beyond it. Trust him. He's given us so much mercy and grace. And whatever we think of the election, whatever we think of what happened, God's extending his mercy out. Not for us to fall asleep, and take, but for us to take advantage of it and not fall asleep and be active in serving him and be active in, in reaching people and drawing people to Jesus a little bit closer. But the reality of it is, people are not going to like that Jesus is king. Did you know that? That you tell them, look, you need to surrender your life to Christ. He's the king. You're not. I know you pretend to be, but you're not. Give it up, man. Surrender. That was me for years. Maybe that was you for years. But we don't like the idea of somebody ruling over us. I didn't like it. The world doesn't like it. How, uh, uh, I'm, I'm supposed to call my own shots. I mean, I, I'm 21. I, I, could, yeah, I wasn't 21. I was 20. Uh, you know, I, I should supposed to be doing my own thing now. You know, got the whole life ahead of me. God had a different plan, and he interrupted it. Thank God. I would have dynamited my whole life. But nobody likes to have somebody ruling over them, unless, unless you see yourself as somebody already being ruled over by someone else. And the reality of it is, in our sin and before Christ, we were serving ourselves, sin, and we're under the power of the devil. And we didn't know that. I mean, it was laughable to me to think, that I'm not doing the devil's will. Come on, are you kidding me? You're crazy. I, I'm doing my own thing. In reality... Doing my own thing was doing exactly what he wanted me to do. See, the, the most amazing thing about Satan is not how evil necessarily he is. That's true, he is. But how deceiving he is. He's brilliant, intelligent, but evil. And the biggest lie that you will swallow today, and the world will swallow today, is that he doesn't exist, or he's just a mythological figure, or he has nothing to do in our lives. And the Bible is completely tells you the complete opposite of it. He says, all right, now you're saved. Now you can see what really is behind door number three. What was really behind your blindness? What was really behind your hardness of heart? What was really behind your issues and difficulties in your marriage? Now you really see. For Christians, now we could see. Now we could actually acknowledge the fact that it's there and do something about it. Before it was like, yeah, let's just go, man. We only chose, we, the only choice I had was when to sin, how to sin, and with whom to sin. That was the only thing I could ever choose. Now, by the grace of God and the power of his spirit, I can say, that's wrong. Stay away or repent. Get on your knees now. Pray for your wife. Pray for your husband. Pray for your children. And that is one of the things that happens when you become a Christian. You begin to see the reality of life. And so Psalm 2 says the reality is people are not going to like Jesus being king and they're going to plot and they're going to try to make counsel together and bring all these plans together in order to overthrow God. Look what verse 3 says. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords. That's it. They're really going to try to go after the relationship between God and his people. But look at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens, that's God, he laughs. God laughs. Did you ever read that? God sings. Did you ever read that? God sings. God walks. You read that? God whistles. You ever hear that? God whistles. No? Got to read it. I'll give you a hint. It's in Isaiah. Just got to read through 66 chapters, but you'll find it. It's okay. I mean, you'll be like, thank you. I read them. When was the last time you read Isaiah, right? Find it. God whistles. God laughs. God walks. God sings. That one's easier to find. I won't let you know where it is because it's a really tiny book at the end of the Old Testament, right? Does anyone know where it is? Where God sings? No? Micah? Micah? Zephaniah. 
God sings and rejoices right? with singing. He does. He rejoices. He sings and he's awesome. But here he laughs. And it says he laughs at what? The Lord laughs and he scoffs at them. He will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, I have put my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. I have begotten you. Ask me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the end of the earth for your possessions. Shall break them with a rod of iron. Because, of course, it's speaking of Jesus. Uh, verse 10. Now, therefore, O kings, show the sermon. Take warning, you judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence. Literally, kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. Uh, the idea of to kiss is to bow down and to pay homage to a king. And that's, my friend, that's totally salvation. When you bow down and you submit to the king. Um, the Bible tells us we'll submit to one thing or another. We'll submit to sin, which is a terrible master, a terrible taskmaster, or we will submit to Jesus, a wonderful shepherd. But he's still our master, right? But he's a good shepherd. Sin is a terrible, horrible taskmaster. And you have to decide today which one you're serving and which one do you want to be under. Because you can't be under both, either one or the other. Taskmaster, sin, controlled by the devil. Jesus, good shepherd, your master, leading you and bringing you to good fruit and good and, 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 and the liver, uh, rivers of living water. But David wants to build a house, and Solomon finishes it, and it just is a beautiful uh, replica of it. And you can see it. it you go through the eastern gate. Again, this, the same idea of the east. You go through the eastern gate, and you go through the steps, right, through the gate of Nicanor, and you go in, and there's a, a, the bronze laver when you can wash, the priests wash themselves, and you go right into the sanctuary, into the very presence of God, just like the tent of meeting, the very presence of God. And God wanted to meet with his people. God wanted to meet with his people. And at the end of the Old Testament, we're told these incredible stories in the book of Chronicles. In the book of Chronicles, we're told something that happened, terrible happened to Israel. The tragedy was that the temple became like a superstition to them. Even though the presence of God was there, the people of Israel said, oh, we can live however we want because we have the temple. And as long as the temple's standing, we're good. It doesn't matter how we live, right? And again, many people live that way today. Um, you know, they go to church as sort of appease, you know, guilt or guilt conscious. And they say, well, you know, especially around Christmas, they, you know, today around the U.S. and the world, people are going to go to church because they haven't been there. And it's been a year or two years or whatever. And uh, maybe they're searching. Maybe they're, I don't know. But the reality of it is many people go there to appease conscious guilt. But the reality of it is maybe God will meet them there and bring them into relationship with them because it's not just about the Sunday. It's about the seven days or the six days that follow that, right? It's seven-day Jesus. It's seven-day Jesus. That's, that's a relationship with God, not a, not a one one day a week thing. Uh, but the temple became so idolatrous so that Ezekiel and Jeremiah says, now they're, they're committing abominations in that temple. They're worshiping other gods. And that, that's it. God had it with them. And eventually the temple was destroyed. But his interesting thing is that the Bible ends with this book, the book of Chronicles. And it tells us something about David, right? There's, a sin, there's, a, there's something in the, the Chronicles about David's sin. There's only one sin in Chronicles that is described in there. It's not even described necessarily as a sin, but he counted his people. He counted the, the number of uh, in the army. And God said, so, you were supposed to do that. And a plague comes on the Jewish people. A plague comes on, and he doesn't know why. And he, he repents, and he has to make an offering to God. But there is only the, temp, the, the tent of meeting. And then he buys the space in Jerusalem from the Jebusites. He buys the plot of land in the, in, in the Jebusites. And the whole story is in the book of Chronicles to let us know how the temple actually began. The temple began with David's sin. And he needed to get right with God. And he says, God, I'll build you a house. And I'm going to buy the plot of land here in Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And I'm going to build you a house. And that's where God says, oh, you build me a house. I'll build you a house. How about that? And uh, God always over, you know, he always... That's better than us. And, but that's how the story ends. And, and of course, the, the, the book of Chronicle ends with, there's going to be a temple. 
It's going to be rebuilt. When Israel comes back from the land, back from Babylon, they will rebuild it. It was an encouraging thing. And of course, now we get to the New Testament. This is where maybe you need to liven up now. Okay, because now we get to God is not going to dwell with temp- in a temple anymore. And this is another thing that he moves. As much as he used the garden, the tent, the temple, God moves again. He's always moving, changing addresses. We, you know, we change addresses too, right? You move. But God moves with the purpose. The idea of a purpose here is to get closer and closer to man, right? First in the garden, but then sin disrupted. Then in a tent. Then in a temple. Now it's not going to be a temple of stone, sort of like this one. It's going to be the temple in the flesh, the temple of a man, the body of a man. And I remember this, this, uh, this beautiful hymn uh, by Charles Wesley. I'd love to sing it, but you don't want me to sing. Uh, earth and heaven combine, the word becomes flesh. Let the earth and heaven combine. Angels and men agree to praise in songs divine. The incarnate deity, our God contracted to a span, incomprehensible made man. People don't write like this anymore. What a shame. But that was a beautiful hymn, Charles Wesley, Earth and Heaven Combined. You sing it during Christmas. By the way, we sang that song, Joy to the World. We sang it today, right? Um, I'm sure you heard me say it like a million times, right? It's not a Christmas song. Did you know that? I'm sorry to destroy and burst your bubble. You can write me later. It is not a Christmas song. Well, why would we sing it? Because it sounds like a Christmas song. Who wrote it? Isaac Watts, famous writer, Christmas uh, uh, um, worships, uh, hymn writer. And they asked Mr. Watts, you wrote the most popular song ever in Christian history. Because it was. When he wrote it, it was, the most, it was the top 40 hits. I mean, if Dick Clark was there, he would have had it playing all morning long. But it was, and then they asked him, what do you, how do you feel about it? He said, Christmas song? I didn't write that a Christmas song. He said, I was reading the book of Revelation. And uh, then I wrote it. It was about when Jesus comes. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. king, right? He was reading Revelation 19, and he said, joy to the world. Jesus has come, not Christmas, the second coming. So now that song even, it's applicable now right? for all year, not just one time a year, all year. We should, I'm propon- proposing to the worship team, we should sing that song a lot more. <laughs> Because it's about the return of Jesus. It's about him coming, but he's coming again. And we got to keep that in mind. Um, I'm sorry to destroy your thinking about Christmas. Now you'll never think of that song again about Christmas. And the pastor destroyed We're never going to sing that song again. No, but it gives meaning to it. It adds more depth to it. Now it's just not Christmas. It's about Jesus coming back. So I could sing it every time. So in, the, in those days... In the days of Jesus, the pagans had temples. They had all kinds of temples. You can see them today. You can go to uh, Caesarea Maritina down in, uh, in, in Israel. You can go to Beth, Beth uh, what is that town called? Beth Hashem? Hashim. Hashim. There we go. Thank you. Uh, you've been there. Okay, praise the Lord. Thank you. Uh, where all these temples are there, it's kind of like the, 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 the pointing or the, or the melting of all these civilizations. And the Greeks had this idea that you ever seen Michelangelo's uh, famous uh, painting of the man in a circle and in a square? You ever seen that? I forgot what they call that man, uh, the virtual something man, right? And uh, if you've ever seen it, it's one of the most famous paintings of, of Michelangelo's. A man stretched out like this, right? And he's in a circle and in a square. And you're like, what? what was he like? Not knowing what to draw that day? He was just doodling? No, it, it came from actually Greek ideas. The Greek ideas was that the length of your finger, from this finger to that finger, is symmetrically uh, same as from here to your toes, right? You, you ever done that? Don't try it now. There's people <laughs> sprawling on, oh, you can measurements, and try it at home. When you get home and you tell your kids, measure me, right? Uh, the Greeks had this idea, and they were fascinated. They're like, whoa, we're the same here as it is here. And they thought, oh, we had to be created. And so they believed that they were divinely created by the gods. Gods, plural, right? So they said, well, if we are, symmet- you know, the symmetry is amazing, we should make all of our buildings that way. And so all the Greeks began to build these, these incredible, the Parthenon, all these stuff, uh, the uh, Athena, Apollos, all these, they're all still there. Most of the, the excavations have been done. 
they were done so symmetrically, beautifully perfect because they loved how the body had symmetry. So they wanted to make their building symmetry. So they were obsessed with the physical body. Did you know that? I told my kids the story. They couldn't believe it. The Greeks were so obsessed with bodies. They were immoral, of course. They had no morality toward godliness that when they created the Olympic Games, right? They were called the Corinthian Games. So that kind of gives you an idea. At the beginning, uh, the Isthmus Games, there were all the Olympic Games that they created, came from them. They would participate uh, naked. Uh, they would participate naked. And so the, the, that was an attraction, obviously, right? That was an attraction to go and, and see this, right? Now you don't even have to, you know, you can just turn on the TV and it's there. I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, I'm not saying to do it. I'm just saying how it permeates our society. And the, the Jews that lived under the Greeks had a choice. They had to live immoral or they had to live like God told them to do. And there was a big push and a big pressure on the Jewish people during the time of the, the Seleucid Empire because they, were, they banned the Bible. This is why Hanukkah came about. They banned the Bible. They banned the worship of God in the temple. And now you had to live like a Greek. Speak Greek, live as a Greek. And so if you were a, a good Jewish boy or a good Jewish girl and you wanted to participate in, in the Greek culture, especially in the Olympics, you had to be naked. And so there you go. You know, and uh, think of it today. You know, if you're a Christian today and you're wanting to be in some enterprise or some uh, commerce or some kind of, whether it's maybe TV or maybe, I mean, I know some people in our fellowship, you know, they're involved in movies, they're involved in script writing. Um, you know how difficult the world is in that? I mean, that's like Hollywood sewer pipe. I mean, you have to be like thoroughly compromised to actually make it successful in that environment. Or the same thing in business. You know, guys that make a lot of money, a lot of times it's compromise. And yet they're believers that own their business, believers that are in business, managing. And the pressure to compromise is tremendous, right? Same thing in the military, same thing in all these things. So I don't even know how we got into that. But the, the, the buildings were there. And yet God was not satisfied with the building. Because in the shadow of the building of the temple... There was a little boy up in the northern part of Israel learning how to be a carpenter. Actually, Jesus was not a carpenter. Another, <gasps> right? I, how could you destroy all the beautiful pictures of Jesus, him making, you know. Yes, he worked with wood, absolutely. But the word for carpenter that is translated carpenter is not carpenter. Like a carpenter makes wood. It's actually the word for builder. Jesus was a builder. You would say a mason today, not a Freemason, but a mason, somebody that works with building materials. Jesus could build. He couldn't just build a table. He could build a house. He could build a, 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 you know, a, a stone building. He had that ability to build. And so when Jesus said, I will build my church, it is a play on words because he was a builder already, but he wasn't building a structure he was building his people. He was building you, building me. He wanted to build us up to be his people. Jesus was a builder, but in Nazareth, he learned the trade from his foster parent, his foster dad, which was Joseph. But the Greeks had this incredible idea. And did you know Jesus spent more time in working in the mundane, everyday, office-type idea than he did in ministry? Oh, I just... And confused the two because I said work and ministry are separate, right? It's the same. The only thing Jesus did, he was fully committed to his trade for 18 years and in, in ministering to God's people in that area, but he wasn't fully in full time ministry, as you would call it. He spent that three years later, or 18 years later, he spent three years in the ministry. So, 18 years as a carpenter or a mason, a builder. Three years as a preacher, teacher of God's word. You ever notice that? We think Jesus is just like, oh, minister, I want to be like Jesus and work in the ministry and serve people and preach the word. Good. Work 18 years in your job, in the office, minister to people there, share God's word there, be faithful to show up on time, do your job, make it right, do it right, have a good attitude. Then come talk to me about ministry. Then come talk to me. These guys that get on the TV, and they, they, 
they've never worked a day in their lives and they just want to, you know, milk you for money, have no idea about the ministry of Jesus. Jesus started there. God started him there. 18 years. 18 years when you think, you know, he's the son of God. He's God. You know, if I was, I'm here for a reason, Father. You know, let me go out there and preach. Nope. You need to learn. You need to learn. You need to be in the everyday. Because it's in the everyday that you'll find the Lord. Right? It's in the everyday stuff, the boring stuff. The way, you know, when you and I think boring, the mundane, the everyday thing, going to the office, turning on the computer, uh, you know, Joel turning on the truck and heading out. That's where the Lord is. Did you know that? That's where God is. And if you do it faithfully, you know what he will do with that job that he gave you? He will make you overseer of much. And it might, he might just take you out of there and put you in a real ministry every day, full time. Why? Because if you were faithful in that, you could be faithful in the other. And that's what Jesus wants. But that's what he did. God revealed himself on the streets. And that's what he did in the book of Hebrews. We read that verse. Uh, we can go back to it, though, by the way, because I want to point something out. By the way, we're almost done. So no, no worries. You'll still have your Christmas Day gifts. You can still open them up. And, and I don't know if you're going to have... I don't know how much food I can actually intake anymore, but there's more back there. Thank God we have it. But um, I'm telling you, it's getting a little scary at times. So much food. Um, God spoke in two different ways. He spoke in the past. Look what it says in verse 1. He spoke long ago. In the past, he spoke. Verse 2. In the last days, he spoke to Jesus, through Jesus. So, in a sense, you can say Jesus divided time in two different, in, in two portions. To God, time is devoted to this. There's the past, and then there's the last days. So, that's how God divides time, according to the book of Hebrews. There's the past. What is the past? The prophets, the temple, the tent of meeting, the garden, the Old Testament. Past. What are the last days? Jesus. His coming. And it's coming again. Those are all part of the last days. I know we try to divide it up in little sequences and things like that, but think of the big picture. To God, the last days started, really, when Jesus came, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was here when Jesus was, was, was on the earth. The king was here, and he was advancing against the kingdom of the enemy. You know, all the healing miracles and all that stuff was, was a, 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 repu a, a refutation of uh, the power of Satan over mankind Jesus would come and he would deliver them. And they would be like, amazing. You didn't even have to know the demon's name. Remember when Jesus talked about the legion, right? Remember legion? I think we talked about that in apologetics class, right? Uh, the, 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 the idea in those days was if you know the demon's name, you can cast anybody out. And so they were all like, you know, that was, that was Jewish mysticism. Even the Pharisees wanted to know, what's his name? What's his name? And then that man is possessed by a legion. And Jesus didn't care to know all their names. He says, get out. Right? The power of Jesus over demonic powers. He didn't need to know their names. He just get out. Go into the pigs. Six, what was it? 6,000 of them. Right? That was the power of Jesus over the demonic world. That was the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom of God began there. The last days began there. But the reality of it is, is that it, it continued on because Jesus' message goes all the way to the end of the age. Go to Hebrews 9. We're going to be in, in Hebrews for a little bit. Hebrews 9.26. We'll do this in rapid succession. Hebrews 9.26. Jesus' message is so, for, it's so much of God's final revelation that there's no reason to listen to anybody else but Jesus. You know, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, uh, even in, in, in Jewish ideas, there's all these extra added testaments, right? Uh, even in Islam, the Quran is the final revelation. Muhammad is the final prophet. Nonsense. The Bible says the, 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 the word of Jesus, his words given to the apostles are the final revelation. Okay, you don't need to listen to anybody else. There's no reason to listen to Mary Baker Eddy. There's no reason to listen to anybody. Joseph Smith, 
the watchtower. Nobody. The Bible doesn't give you that option. The Bible doesn't say, yeah, you know, Jesus is pretty cool, but wait until you get these other guys. Oh, you'll be really, you know, all that revelation, right? You know, even, even in charismatic Pentecostal circles today, even with the, you know, the, the, the New Apostolic Reformation, all these visions and dreams and revelation. But <laughs> did they read the Bible? The Bible says this is it. You don't need anything else. Hebrews 9.26 Speaking of Jesus, otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at, at the consummation of the ages, the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus is the final manifestation to the end of the ages. What is the end of the age? Didn't Jesus say, I'll be with you even till the end of the age? It's a fascinating word. We don't have time to do the study, but you can do it on your own. The idea of ages. What is the age? There is the Old Testament, right? And then there's the last days. That's what the book of Hebrews says. The Jews believed that there were going to be two ages. The sinful, evil age, and then the age of the Messiah. And they thought, well, when the Messiah comes, the evil one will stop, and the new one will begin, and will be happily ever after in the kingdom of the Messiah. Amen. That's what they believed. So Jesus came and they said, all right, we're ready. He's it. Triumphal entry coming down the Mount of Olives. The new age is about to start. And he was killed. Wow. What happened? Because they, they didn't read all the Old Testament specifically. The Old Testament didn't tell us that it was just going to start right there. The New Testament reveals it more. But he was going to suffer and die for our sins. And the new age, not the new age of you know, Shirley MacLaine and these people there, not that new age, but the new age, the age of the Messiah, it's been, has started while at the same time the evil age has not stopped. Did you ever notice that? There's still crimes and persecution and evil and sin. And Paul says to the Corinthians, you live in the overlap of the ages. You know that headache you have, that argument you had with your wife and spouse or children, or you know, the sin that you deal, the battles that you face, your backache. That is the overlap of the ages, where the evil age didn't stop. It's still here. I can go outside and tell you. I can watch the news today. The war in Syria, the wars and rumors of war, destruction. It's still here. But there's also the age of the Jesus, isn't it? There's also the Spirit. There's also the joy of the Lord. There's also the power of the Spirit in the church. There's also that. And it overlaps. That means it's happening at the same time. And that overlap is where you and I live. Waiting for the Messiah to fully reveal the new age to come. Remember the book of Corinthians says, To us has been revealed the power of the age to come. We have a taste of the power of the age to come. You know, the fellowship, the love, of the, the, the love of the Lord, the love of the Spirit, the fellowship, the unity, the, the body of Christ coming together. That is a foretaste of what the kingdom of God's going to look like. And as great as it is, sometimes you're like, man, I never want to leave. Then I have to go home and, you know, take the trash out and <laughs> deal with sin and deal with my... It's like, oh, I was just... It was just wonderful over there. Now I have to... You know, unplug the toilet and all this stuff. And it's like, oh, this is certainly not the age of the Messiah yet. Why? It's the overlap. I'm still in that overlap. I'm waiting for Jesus to come. That's the overlap. But he's coming. But the book of Hebrews says, Jesus, his words are till the final, the final part of the ages. And there's only one God who's speaking, by the way. I know people have made, made in the early church said, oh, there's two different gods. Old, plus Old Testament God and New Testament God. The Bible says God spoke in the Old Testament and God speaks to us through Jesus today. Now, there's a fullness of the revelation. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's 1 Peter is uh, a little bit to the right. 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to show you something about this is, uh, these verses that we're going to show in a minute are absolutely amazing. I mean, you read them in context of what we're trying to say about the coming of Jesus. And what he revealed to us. First Peter chapter 1, verse 10. As to this salvation, the salvation that God has for us, the prophets, 
Old Testament, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, as he predicted, the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And these things now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels long to look into. See, what Jesus brought to us was just more than just a Bible study. I know some of you go, Bible study is boring, it's taking too long, etc. But when you read about the grace and the salvation that God has brought to us, the revelation of what he has given to us, things Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Daniel, wonderful men of God, they couldn't quite get it. They couldn't quite grasp it. Because God spoke to them in portions and in different ways and in different glimpses, you could say. Glimpses. They could see it, but they weren't really sure how the full picture would look like. To you, he says, to you, he has given you the entire picture. To you, you get it. Why? Because you believe the gospel of Jesus. To you, salvation is clear. You go, oh yeah, it's right here. I can go to the Old Testament and show you. Man, do you know why I know that? Because God revealed it to us through his spirit by means of the Old Testament and New Testament, I could now understand the plan of God. Do you know how incredibly privileged? That, will, that, that's, that is amazing. I mean, that, you are incredibly privileged beyond anyone ever in the Old Testament. As godly as those men and women were, you know more. You know more than Daniel. You know more than Ruth. You know more than Esther. You know more than Noah. You know more than Isaiah. Wow. God got a good thing when he got me. No! He had to redeem you and get you out of the gutter. That was me. Because he delights in revealing it to you. He wants to reveal it to you. Why? Because he wants you to be in his family. And even it says angels don't get it. You know, angels, this is not to be in any way hyper-spiritual, but angels look upon the things that God has given you. There might be angels here today. And I'm not talking about your wife, but it might be angels here just relating to us. She's an angel. My wife's right there, right? There's always a question, which kind of angel, right? But uh, <laughs> husbands don't say amen. But the idea is angels desire to look into these things. What things? Angels have no clue what grace and mercy is like. They could see it. They could acknowledge it, that God does that. But they have never experienced it in themselves. They don't know what it's like for God to forgive them of sin. They don't know what it's like for you to say to God, No, I'm not going to do that. And God doesn't judge you right there and then. And he allows his mercy to forgive you and give you another chance. I mean, that's just like, what? I mean, one third of those guys did it. And they get God damned to hell. And God, you're so merciful to these creatures. Look, they don't even listen to you. They don't even care. That's what Satan probably does. They don't care. Look, they don't listen. You save them, but they just walk like if they're no big deal. They sin. They don't care. They know the truth, but they don't live like it. And God is patient. And he's patient, says, I love them. My son died for them. They'll get it right. I have my spirit in them. I don't know exactly what God says, but maybe something like that. But his hand of protection remains. Why? Because his son died for you. And angels just go, what? I got to look into this more. And they might look at Anthony, and they look at Andre, and look at Joel, and look at us and go, what does God see in them? I, I don't know. Do you know? I have no idea. But every Sunday they're here, so God must be something about that. And they're puzzled. That they're like, how? Why? And they're learning how merciful and gracious our Lord is, that he would become one of us. 
when angels looked at Jesus, it was the first time, more than likely, they saw the face of their creator. Because God dwells in unapproachable light. You can't see him. You can only see his glory. That's what Moses saw. Remember, Moses said, Lord, let me see your glory. Okay. Moses, you will die if you see me. I mean, that's amazing if you think about that. Okay, God, I won't look. <laughs> I said, but I'm going to do something for you. Moses, you could see my glory as I pass by. You could see the afterglow. And his face radiated for months. And he had to put a, a veil over his face because the glory that he was, the, the face was shining as his glory. And he didn't want the juice to see that it was fading away eventually. But he was completely immersed in the glory of God. And yet, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, John saw him face to face. He saw Jesus face to face. God became one of us so you can see him face to face. The Bible says, in the beginning, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. The book of John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Right? Literally, the word means the word was face to face with God, and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. Right? It was the, the idea that we could see Jesus. People saw Jesus. They saw God. They could see the, the, the face of God, the mercy of God. Angels was, was astounding. I, I got to keep going because I got to finish. But the idea of grace and truth, when Moses was in that mountain, God revealed Exodus 34. I'll write it down because we've got to finish. Exodus 34. God tells Moses 13 characteristics of who he is. 13. God is gracious, kind, full of compassion, long-suffering. I forget all the other ones because there's like a train of them. Right? They call it the, the name of the Lord is the locomotive and the train is the... The rest of the train are the characteristics of God. But one of the main ones that he talked about is his loving kindness. It says, the Lord is merciful and loving kindness. And the word is love. It's the word hesed, hesed in, in Hebrew. Just write it down. Don't worry about it. You can ask me later. And it literally means God's faithfulness. He was faithful. He was going to be faithful to the Jews. Even though the Jews would not be able to complete God's word, they failed at it, God was going to keep his end of the bargain. He was going to be faithful. And the other word that is used there, it's, it's, it's the word faithful, but it's also the word truth. So God is merciful, full of loving kindness. That loving kindness, it's, it's a beautiful word. It literally means faithful, but it means full of truth. God is faithful because he's full of truth. He's not going to lie to you. Amen. Yeah, there's one person in this universe that will never lie to you, and that's God. Amen. People will fail. They'll lie to you. They'll betray you. They'll tell you nice things in your ears, tell you sweet little lies. But God will never, ever lie to you. Amazing thing about that. God will never lie to you. You can trust him. You can f he's the only one that you can fully trust him. Not even man. Man will fail. This pastor will fail. But God will never fail you. He'll tell you the truth. So just listen to what God says in his word. And every verse you talked about today, check it out, read it, because don't trust me. Trust God. And the Bible says that he's full of truth. That's why he's faithful. So in the book of John, John 1, 14, you can turn there with me if you like, but I'll just read it carefully so I can, uh, quickly, so I can uh, finish. In John 1, 14, it tells us this, that Jesus... Is the, come in the flesh. The word became flesh, and he dwelled among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The identical words that was used in the Old Testament, but in Hebrew, for the God who showed himself up to Moses. John is letting you know that the God who was in, at the time of Moses, revealing his glory, full of faithfulness and truth, kindness, mercy, it's the same one in the person of Jesus whom you see face to face now. He has all the full of truth. He has all the grace. You can trust him. He's the same God. And these promises are fulfilled in the, uh, in the New Testament. I'll just tell you about it because we got to go. Simeon picks up Jesus, Luke chapter 2, and he lifts him up and he says, Now, Lord, your servant can depart in peace because I have seen your salvation, right? He was a man that God told him by the Spirit that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And that old man was there. Everything was going. Eyesight was going. Everything was going. 
he sees Jesus come and he lifts him up and he says, Now, Lord, I can depart in peace. I've seen Yeshua. Literally, the word for salvation. He's seen Yeshua means salvation. It's a play on words. I've seen your salvation. I've seen Jesus. I've seen salvation. It was the same name for Jesus. And, but he says the word now. You know you can do this on your own. Go and find the word now, three letters, N-O-W. Find them in your Bible and see how much they relate to Jesus in the last days. I'll give you one example. The Bible says that Paul was so amazed by this glory that God has shown him that he revealed it to the churches. And he says, now, those things that were hidden, mystery, you know, not like uh, the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, not that kind of mystery, but the mystery of that was fragmented in the old, remember, in pieces. God spoke to them in pieces and fragments. He's revealed it to us fully. That which God revealed then, right? Paul says, that mystery now has been revealed to you now. You Gentiles, Ephesians 3, Colossians 1. You Gentiles have the complete picture. You were far from God, now you know it. Things that godly people in the Old Testament have no clue or have partial truth, but now is given to you. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? Oh, it's a great thing. I learned it today. Not good enough. Take that truth and give it to someone. Because God wants to reveal himself to that person as well. God revealed himself to you. God will reveal himself to them. Who is he going to use? Manny. No. You. You'll use Manny for sure. But he wants to use you. Andre. No. We always think of someone else. That would be really good for that person to serve in that ministry. I really think he should be in the evangelistic ministry. He should be really good at it. And never. (laughs) Here's what we think. Me? No. I think he's much better suited than me. And, we, and you're like, God, God goes, no, I want to use you. See, because that guy's really good. You know, he, he knows the Bible really well, and he's well-spoken. And so when he shares, people are going to think, well, just because he's really good. I'm going to take you, and I'm going to show you. And when people hear you, they're going to be like, wow, has to be God. Because this guy doesn't know anything. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> Did you know that? That's my story. And it's like, why? Because I will take more glory in that you don't know anything, and I will give you my truth so you can tell people about it. That's how God works. Not the strong. He doesn't call the strong, the smart ones, the intelligent ones. He calls the weak. He calls the fools. He calls those who can't help themselves so he can be their help. That's why God operates. In 2 Corinthians, we're told, now salvation is today. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the day. Did you hear the word now? Now. That's what Simeon said. Now, Lord, I see your salvation. Paul says, now has been revealed to you. Corinthians says, now today is the day of salvation. It, it compresses the time to say, you don't have to wait because now it's the time. Now it's the time. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, if any man in Christ, men, women, right? In Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Now all things have become new. Kind of like the Old and New Testament, right? All things have passed away. It's been fulfilled. But now new things are ahead. The New Testament is ahead. That's the word now. You get, uh, there's a lot more to it. I, I don't mean to... Mean to Uh, complicate things, but think of the word now. God did it then, now he's doing this with Jesus. And you know what God says about now? He says, now is the time for you to come to him. Now is the time. Oh, come out tomorrow. No, now is the time. The, The emphasis is on the present. You hear it, don't harden your heart to the words of Jesus, and come to him now. Why? Because in the fullness of time, God revealed himself in his son, Jesus. And if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart, the book of Hebrews says. Now, in Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, he says, woman, you think you're going to worship in Mount Gerizim? The Jews said they're going to worship in Jerusalem. 
I tell you what, neither. Because now, those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. Did you hear the emphasis on now, right? Now is the time to worship God. Why? Because all who come to God, they don't have to go to a location, uh, the, the temple, Mount Gerizim, Mount, uh, Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Now you have to come to God and worship God. And he'll give you his truth. He'll give you his spirit. And if you're going to worship him, you must have his truth and his spirit. And he'll give that to you if you want it. When? Now. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, Jesus says. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the now. We thank you that in a real time, in a real way, you're calling people today under this roof and maybe through the media. You're saying today, now is the time. He has come now. You need to come now. And Lord, we come to you as, as a faithful creator, as a loving father, whose heart broken over the fact that we left or departed. Lord, I pray that they would respond to your call today. On this Christmas morning, Hanukkah, festival of lights and dedication, people would dedicate themselves to you, Lord. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. So, Lord, I pray that the hearts will not be hardened, but they'll be open to your spirit today to receive you as a faithful God, as a loving Savior, as a merciful God who loves us with full of grace and truth, and those who come to him as worship God in spirit and in truth. Lord, give us your spirit. Lord, give us your truth. Help us to worship you today. Thank you for your amazing grace that you came as a man. You came in, in, in the incarnation. You fully clothed as a man to reveal God to us. The God of the tent, the God of the temple, the God in the garden. We can see him face to face. And Lord, we will see you face to face. A time is coming, Lord God, where we will see you face to face. And so, Lord, help us to do it now. Worship you now. Give us your truth, Lord. Use us now. All this truth has been revealed to us. Help us to proclaim it, share it, pass it on to a world that's so desperate, Lord, to, to hear your good news, that you're going to come and you're going to reign and you're going to be king and people don't have to suffer anymore. There'll be no pain. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sin. Lord, help us to preach the resurrection of Jesus that that's what's going to happen to us. There'll be a resurrection. There'll be a change. There'll be a glory. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. God is not done. He's given us his spirit. God has come down again. Next Sunday on New Year's, and I can't think of a most beautiful time to celebrate the new year God has given us, is to think of the Holy Spirit coming down and to think of God coming down again in the New Jerusalem. That's what Christians need to focus on today. The work of the Spirit in your life. The work of the Spirit in your life. What is He doing? What is He showing you? What is He sharing with you? And maybe if you haven't come to Jesus, He's convicting you for you to come. But for believers... He wants to do something in you by his spirit, through his spirit, to empower you. Then he's going to meet us in the new Jerusalem. But today is the day. Now is the time that we have. Worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. Seek him with all your heart. He will reveal things to you that are hard to believe. But because it's not based on us, he will do it. He just needs us to walk with him. He wants us to walk with him so he can do it. He provides the energy. We provide the effort. Here I am, Lord. Send me. 
God bless you guys. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. See you guys on Wednesday. And there's another. There's